Welcome back to the lab. Today we're going to talk about what it took to transform our schematic into a set of design outputs that an automated manufacturing line can produce. This will cover PCB layout, some basic design for manufacturing checks that were done, features that we added to the PCB fab itself to help the assembler work more efficiently, and of course the documents that were required for the assembly house to process our design. Now that's a lot to cover in one video, but I think we can do it. Let's dive in. Let's start here with step one, PCB layout. If we don't set ourselves up for success now, we'll never get there. If there's one thing that I've learned is that a little bit of preparation can save us a lot of rework. Therefore, before I even got started with the layout, I asked myself these two questions. Who drank the last cup of coffee? And what's for dinner? Wait, that's not right. Uh, Who's going to create and assemble our PCB, and what kind of enclosure will meet our requirements? These two questions lead into a couple deeper questions when evaluating who will create and assemble our PCB. Now, it's important to make note of and consider whoever we select, consider their technical capabilities, and it's equally important to consider if there are any enclosures available as standard off-the-shelf parts. If these standard parts meet our requirements, leveraging the existing standards for the enclosure could save us a lot of time and money. To try to answer our first question completely, we turn to PCB Shopper. This website is by no means a full or complete list of every PCB and assembly service on the market, but they do have some bargain brands, so to speak, and they have some Cadillac offerings, where you get a little more quality, but pay a lot more. And on this site, one can find Everything from services with full electrical testing and quality processes, all the way down to quick and dirty offerings, which are ironically cheaper and cheaper than dirtypcbs.com. Way cheaper. We enter our design inputs into PCB Shopper to get some quotes, entering our PCB specs, including size, layer count, and surface finish. We then found a few solutions in the around $100 price range for five boards. That should be perfectly sufficient for what we're doing. For assembly, we entered in the quantity of unique part numbers, and that's important because it tells the assembler how many different parts they need to program into their pick and place machine. We can really set up our design for success by realizing this in the design phase in the schematic land and eliminating any unnecessary or redundant component values. This practice is called bill of materials or BOM consolidation. The process of programming a pick and place machine can take a while so the assembler needs to know how much programming they'll need to do on this machine. It could be a big factor in total assembly cost. In fact, I expect it to be the biggest player since we're only building five boards. The assembler will also need to know the raw number of components to be placed besides just the unique count, and this gives them a full picture of how long our board will require in the pick and place machine. These two parameters, the number of components and the number of unique components, allows for a very accurate estimation of assembly cost because they directly reflect the quantity of operator and machine hours required to build the boards. The estimate that we get should be valid unless something unexpected comes up. For example, parts with incorrect data sheets, invalid or out-of-sync pick-and-place files where they don't match our layout, or component-to-footprint mismatches. These errors can, and do, slow things down. With our component metrics totaling 43 unique parts and 345 total parts for each board, most quotes hung around the $300 range for five boards. Not great, but there was one outlier at almost $100, which is cheap, crazy cheap. Programming 43 parts and placing a total of 1,725 parts for only $100? This comes out to an assembly cost of six cents per part. For comparison, Seed Studio quotes between one and 30 cents per part for their placement. Some might say that this low of a price seems too good to be true, but is it possible that all PCB could really manufacture a board for $100? Could it be that they've harnessed some form of time travel or dark energy to crank out PCBs three times cheaper than their competitors? Will our SMT components get assembled into a routine life of monotony or continue to live on as free spirits embracing their endless possibilities for their place in life? More on that later. Do not run off and send your board files to all PCB until you hear about the rest of our experience. Our default board house for EE for Everyone projects has slowly transitioned into JLC PCB almost exclusively. Their service is fast, we've had no issues with their product, and it's pretty cheap. However, they don't offer assembly, at least not in the US yet. 
Once they do, they might become our default assembler too. And this is because JLPCB also has deep ties to a component distributor, LCSC, and all three together would make them a one-stop PCB supply chain and assembly service solution. Awesome. That can help to save cost because the distributor would know that the company is able to make profit not only on the components, but also on the assembly, and they might cut you a deal. Regardless, that wasn't an option for us today, and since our projects are all about learning and sharing that learning with you, we decided to roll the dice on that outlier, the $100 assembly service quoted by All PCB. After digging in a little further, we found that All PCB also fabs PCBs and sources components from outside distributors, including LCSC. And that's the distributor owned by the same company as JLC PCB, which I found very interesting, even if not terribly relevant. At this point, we've committed to using all PCB for the PCB construction, assembly, and sourcing the components on our bomb. Letting them do all three of these should save us some money on shipping costs, which is awesome, and it should also open up some alternate sourcing options for them in the Chinese market. Now, I'm open to this. Since we're capable of replacing parts in our lab if we get a part that seems to misbehave or violate its specs, and this company, All PCB, has the same manufacturing specs as JLC PCB for recommended routing, drilling diameter, edge rail width, etc., everything. So our standard design rules will still apply. Speaking of those edge rails, though, this is a great transition into designing for manufacturability. Edge rails are a mechanical feature that's added to the outside of a PCB so it can be held and travel through an automated assembly line. It serves no electrical function after the boards are assembled, purely mechanical, and typically they have to be removed in order to fit a board in its enclosure. It's possible that these rails may be used to hold a panel of multiple boards together as well, to hold them together through the manufacturing process for later separation. Despite these rails' short lifespan, they are very important. The small strip of PCB on either side of our actual board uh, saves a lot of headaches during the manufacturing process. Without these rails, components would need to be placed between three and five millimeters away from the board edge, and assembling odd-shaped or round boards would be impossible. The minimum requirement for us is three millimeters of board so that they can actually hold onto it, but just to avoid any issues, we gave ourselves a little bit of margin, five millimeters. In addition, to make removing these rails more easy, we spec'd routing and v-scoring along where the edge rail meets our design so that we can snap them off more cleanly and with less effort. All PC didn't even charge us for the v-scoring, which is a sweet deal assuming they actually do it. Time will tell, I suppose. Again, we aren't done talking about all PCB yet. Don't stop watching. Don't go give them your money without hearing our full and complete experience, including our design for manufacturability checks. Our experience may turn you away or encourage you to use them. It all depends on your risk tolerance and what kind of experiences you're looking for in life. It all depends on how much effort you're willing to put into negotiating with people. We'll dive into all that soon, but let's finish setting up our context first. We'll enforce the trace width and spacing constraints specified by our supplier by setting up design rules in our PCB tool, KiteCAD. It should be noted that in many places, we'll enforce more strict spacing constraints to avoid violating creepage requirements. And creepage distance is an engineered gap between conductors on an insulating dielectric that limits the leakage current allowed to flow between the two conductors. Following the creepage guidelines as a rule of thumb is a great way to ensure that regions of our designs that should be galvanically or electrically isolated truly are. But never mind that for now, we can dive in later, but this could really be a whole discussion on its own, creepage and clearance. If you'd like to learn more about designing high voltage circuits, which requires creepage and clearance distances to be followed, let us know in the comments. For now, let's answer our second question. What kind of enclosure do we need to meet our requirements and will this need to be custom made? Custom enclosures take a long time to design. We noticed that with our plant light project. We put in the time to model and 3D print a custom enclosure for that project, but let's decide if that will really be necessary again for us today. There are a couple of system level requirements that relate to enclosure selection, and let's highlight these, starting with system requirement eight. The system shall be designed such that if a fire were to start within the system, the flames will be contained until the melting point of steel is reached. I interpret this to mean that the enclosure should be made out of steel, because I know how to read, and because I read it that way, it's not a great requirement, but I have seen worse. 
Typically, I'd like this requirement to state something more general like, the enclosure shall contain any fire that may occur within the UPS. That would allow us to choose the best material to contain whatever fire was possible inside the unit, but in this case, let's just stick with steel and move on because it will be fine. System requirement nine states, the system shall provide adequate cooling for the power circuitry, which in combination with system requirement three, the primary output of the converter shall have an output power greater than or equal to 120 watts, but not exceeding 1200. These two together tell us that the enclosure must be suitable for keeping electronics cool when something on the order of 120 to 240 watts is dissipated in the enclosure. Not a trivial ask by any means, but it is possible. System requirement 10 is the last system level requirement we have defined about enclosures. Any required daughter cards should be mechanically stabilized by screws. Okay, our requirements tell us that it should be possible to have a steel enclosure which prevents fire from escaping, that this enclosure should be able to have 240 watts passing through it without causing excessive internal temperature rises, and it should have positions to mechanically stabilize daughter cards. When I hear this, it's practically screaming, computer enclosure, right in my ear. In fact, computer motherboards follow a series of standard footprints, and that means that if our board is as small as 170 millimeters or 6.7 inches square, all the way up to the extended ATX footprint, which is 305 millimeters or 12 inches by 13 inches, we will be able to find computer cases in a variety of shapes, colors, and sizes to fit our design inside. Computers can consume hundreds or even thousands of watts of power, so these enclosures are already optimized to whisk that heat away from the internal components. We'll target the ATX form factor as a starting point, which is about 12 by 9.6 inches, then shrink things down or grow if we need to. Now, the most exciting thing about this decision is that it will allow us to grab an off-the-shelf 3, 4, or 2U server enclosure. That's right, baby! Our UPS will be rack-mountable! And this decision would even open up using ATX form factor power supplies as the main input for the system. Should be noted that computer power supplies won't likely be able to supply the power we need, since we need one powerful 11 to 40 volt supply and a lot of amps. Computer power supplies are typically designed with multiple smaller internal rails that supply individual sub-circuits of a computer. The only customization we'll really need to do to our case are adding longer standoffs to enforce our clearance distances underneath the board. That's easy stuff. By leveraging the existing mechanical ATX mounting standard, we can save ourselves a lot of design effort here. Since our enclosure needs to be metal, leveraging someone else's production line will probably save us a lot of money too since we can't 3D print it. There's a time for custom and there's a time for off the shelf. When you design something, you must be open to considering every option. Okay, I think we're ready to start our layout now. We know how big the board can be, we know where our mounting holes should go, our schematic's complete, we don't have any netlist errors, which we verified using the design rule checker in the schematic tool, and then we exported our netlist and got to work. I wanted to capture this whole process for you, but it seems like there's some conflicts between how KiCad and OBS used my graphics card, because KiCad kept crashing periodically when the recording software was open. Regardless, I fought through this struggle to create this time lapse for you, and let's talk about what we did while it plays. What happens during PCB layout? Well, there are a few phases to the process of creating a PCB. The first phase is grouping, where we pull all the components into the board file and then we'll group them by which subcircuit they belong to. Our schematic is great reference material for this effort because it provides context for each footprint. Components placed near each other on a schematic should typically be placed near one another in the layout as a general rule of thumb, and most PCB designers follow this rule. Since we designed the schematic, we also have some intuitive tribal knowledge about where things should be grouped and placed as well, which certainly helps to speed things up. Next comes placement, and this is where we'll rearrange the components to compress them as much as possible, fitting them inside of our board outline. This is how we can squeeze our circuits together into a board when space gets tight. By optimizing placement of components such that the space is utilized well, you'd be amazed at the density that's possible even if it comes at the cost of adding additional routing layers to the PCB. Speaking of routing, that's next. Though it should be noted that I ended up doing a pre-route during placement, so I broke this process just a little. The pre-routing ensures that I untangled all of the circuits efficiently, and we circled back to optimize this preliminary routing later after all of our components were well within the board outline. 
I consider this more of a style thing and less of a right-wrong thing. I'm sure that some people would scoff at doing a preliminary route during placement, but it's how I work most efficiently. As the kids say, you do you, man. You do you. The optimization process probably takes the longest of all these steps, and as a designer, seeing the PCB routing can raise some red flags when I see something weird. If there's a net, for example, that needs to go halfway across the board, or a component across an isolation boundary that shouldn't be, yeah, something's gone horribly, horribly wrong. Multi-part packages like four gate op amps give an opportunity for these types of mistakes. And this could happen if gates are used in different parts of the design without noticing. So you have like one A or U2, A, B, C, D, if D is used on the high voltage side, it's a mess. So I like to keep all the gates for a single physical part on one page of a schematic, unless I have a good reason not to. Helps to avoid these kinds of mistakes. And at its core, optimization, which is the next step, is all about seeing things you don't like and fixing it. And while there are technical, rational reasons behind every decision, it can get a bit subjective. There are many good rules of thumb that guide good electromagnetic compatibility, or EMC, design practices, and bringing a board closer and closer to these practices will help to ensure that the board works as intended. This is because every circuit board is a radiator of radio frequency energy and is also susceptible to this energy when radiated by nearby equipment. With poor EMC design, it's even possible to design a board that interferes with itself. We went through about seven rounds of schematic and layout optimization, as well as an independent review before we felt comfortable packaging the design for manufacturing. This was a full schematic and layout review. With the optimization and review steps complete, our layout was constrained to the manufacturing capabilities of all PCB, and the bomb is ready to roll, so I think it's time to consider assembly. There were really only two things that we needed to do at this point, add fiducials and add edge rails. The edge rails really aren't anything fancy, I just sketched out a rectangle, added some routed slots to make removing the rails easier, and the reason why we added these slots is again because I imagined that breaking a 12 inch long V-score with only 5 millimeters of board to hold onto wouldn't exactly be my idea of fun. So I made these rails a little bit larger than required by the assembly service because margin in all things is usually good. I'd rather pay for 4 millimeters of extra PCB width than get to the assembly step and have them tell me that they can't populate 50 parts because they're too close to our board edge. Fiducials, which is the last part of this, are a high contrast marker and consists of a silk screen keep out, a solder mask keep out, and a copper circle. The combination of these three provide a way for the pick and place machine operators to index our board, which helps them to program the X and Y coordinates that we supplied in our pick and place file into their machine. Two of these are technically sufficient because it lets them find the spacing between them in one point and it helps them to index the whole board, but I added a few more just in case it makes someone's life easier or an operator didn't like one of my fiducials. In general, I give board houses a lot of margin. For example, JLC PCB quotes a 3.5 mil trace in space. But when you look at their layer alignment tolerance, drill position tolerance, and drill size tolerance, they all stack up in such a way that if 3.5 mil trace in space were actually followed, some vias might break out or not have a copper pad surrounding them on all sides, which I would consider to be a completely unacceptable manufacturing defect. I've yet to build a board that required the absolute minimum allowable tolerances of PCB fab manufacturer, and I'll give them two to three time margin if I can. For this board, we used 10 mil trace, eight mil space. When ordering, we claimed six and six, since we don't require better than that, and the 10 mil trace width also provides the ability to carry more current than the six mil trace of the same thickness. This, in turn, makes our life easier because more nets fall under our generic net class meaning that we don't need to have as many classes of nets. These were considered in a similar way where we added some margin to the capability of the board house, and then we designed to consider the current carrying capability of the traces and vias and paired an appropriately signed via so that one via can handle the current of one trace. Just makes it easier to think about down the road. Moving on from here, we did a final round of checks in our bomb, verifying that part numbers matched the descriptions, making sure that DMP parts were truly DMP because we don't want our assembler ordering a bunch of extra parts that they don't need to put on a board, then we struck the DMP parts from the bomb to avoid confusion, telling all PCB to populate only the reftes listed on the bomb we provided. After verifying the part values listed in the schematic match what the bomb shows, 
We then verify that the correct footprint was mapped to each component, and we did this by checking the data sheet and the orderable part number that was listed across with the uh, footprint that's on the PCB. We actually found a few critical errors here. There are a few instances where the schematic symbol was mapped incorrectly to pins one, two, and three on a transistor, yeah, or a diode, in fact, and uh, some places where we use Y-body packages instead of a standard width package, little things like that. And I say little things, but these little things can obliterate the manufacturability of a board, requiring ugly point-to-point -point wiring to fix the issue. Despite all of our care and these DFX checks, there's one thing that I know I didn't check and should have because it bit us. We didn't verify the tolerances listed for every component on the schematic. And I realized too late that I accidentally pulled forward some 5% legacy resistors that were from the plant light project of proof of concept inverter. Those boards were hand built. And when I ordered parts for those builds, I just substituted a 1% part when ordering on DigiKey, which corrected for my mistake in a terrible error prone and manual way. This type of substitution just isn't possible now that manufacturing is involved. Making a seemingly easy substitution after an assembler already ordered parts and has a manufacturer part number loaded in their system, that just provides the opportunity for more mistakes to be made. Component library management is an important task that would have mitigated this problem, but I don't have a component library management team and we're spread a little thin here. So I tried to save ourselves some time by not building a custom part for every RNC within the manufacturer part number and tolerances baked in. And I should have done that but I didn't to save some time and the copy paste game bit me. 5% resistors will probably be fine in all cases and they'll certainly be fine in most cases. I know that in many cases where it was a critical resistor, I spec a tighter tolerance than 1%, so those circuits are unaffected. For general pull-ups and pull-downs where the 5% parts were used primarily, the resistor value has very little effect on performance, so that'll be fine too. I can always swap out a few critical parts by hand if necessary, and I mean, that's why we used 0603 parts in the first place. I found 0603 to be a good compromise between component size and hand solderability when push comes to shove. Well, at this point, we have our schematic complete, layouts finished, reviewed, optimized, ready for automated assembly. We verified our component values are captured correctly in the parts listed on our bomb, and the footprints in our layout map correctly to the parts being purchased. This means that we're ready to export our Gerbers, which capture all the detail of the artwork, or the copper, solder mask, etc. And the Gerbers contain information about all the geometries, the copper shapes, silk screen, solder mask, edge routing, the whole thing. We also need to provide some drill files, which gives whole diameter and location information. It's helpful to a board house if you align the 00, zero coordinate or origin of all of your files to the same point. I typically do this in the upper left hand corner of my boards for no part particular reason, that's just always what I've done. As long as the origin of all your files are the same, that should help to prevent misalignment between the drill and the different Gerbers. And if you do have an error here, the result is scrapping a board because all your drills are in the wrong spot. The last output that we need are the pick and place file, which gives X, Y, and rotation information for the pick and place machine operators and the bomb, which tells all PCB which components to buy, place, and where to place them. We zipped up all this information, sent it over the wall, and all PCB gladly took our money and got to work. Oh. Right. That. Speaking of money, we originally quoted $129 for the PCB fabs and around $100 for the assembly. Super cheap, super great. However, manufacturing the fabs, uh, after they did that, I received an updated estimate of over $500 for the assembly work. That's a ridiculous 500% increase in price. Now, I was already boiling, but before I got too upset, I reached out to their contact asking if there was a problem with the parts I selected or if some of my design inputs were causing them an issue, just trying to figure out what the problem was. I mean, for a 500% increase in cost from a quote, I'd have to imagine that something, somewhere about one of the files I gave them, the design inputs would have to be causing them an inconvenience. But, uh, nope. Said that wasn't the problem. They said that my parts were fine, that the number of parts were not the issue, and that reducing the number of unique parts they needed to program into their equipment would not reduce the cost. Which is weird because programming a pick and place machine takes at least a few hours, and comparing that to the probable 30 to 40 seconds it'll take to place every component on the board 
doesn't really make sense that uh, reducing the programming time wouldn't reduce the cost, since it's probably the most expensive part of this whole process. Their contact informed me that this was a problem with their quoting tool, but I'm not really buying that, because if they wanted to fix their quoting tool, they would. To be honest, if I had known that all PCB was going to jerk me around this way, I probably would have used someone else. There's a few other Chinese PCB assembly services, and there are a couple options out there with a lot of good reviews. One that stood out to me in this whole mess was Seed Studio. If you design their standard parts into your design, they'll be able to turn your board around faster and cheaper than any other company because up front they tell you which parts they stock and they keep a stock on hand. PCB Card, Shenzhen to You, and Canadian company Bittel also have four star ratings or above on PCB Shopper compared with all PCB's stunning zero reviews. But come on, can you blame me? If all PCB could have actually assembled 400 parts onto a almost square foot board for $100, wouldn't that have been incredible? And this was all a learning experience, like I said. If I picked a reasonably priced company that quoted things accurately and delivered on time, what would there be to learn? Unfortunately, this, like most things, turned out to be too good to be true, and I'd personally rather give my money to a company that will honor its original quoted prices and quote things accurately. I was able to talk down all PCB back to a reasonable price point, matching their competition's quoted prices of around $300, but I shouldn't have needed to. Negotiating to pay 300% more than you were quoted instead of 500% is not a negotiation that I think ever needs to happen. And I'd love to tell you more about our experience with all PCB, about the quality of their work, etc. But so far, it's about two weeks past their estimated shipment date with no end in sight. All I can say is stay tuned for our future videos and follow us on social media. We'll blast out notices on Twitter and MeWe when we can live stream our unboxing and first impressions for the quality of all PCB's work. Follow us at EE for everyone to stay in touch and be the first to know when our fabs arrive. All this to say, is all PCB the cheapest assembler in China? No. Is their quote tool accurate? No. Is the quality of their work worth the extra $200 we spent on top of the quoted price? Was it worth the negotiating to make this happen? We'll see when the boards arrive. The latest estimate I have is the second week of February, but I'm starting to lose hope. We may need to disengage with all PCB entirely and start this process over with another assembler. If I wanted to consider using all PCB again, I'd need to multiply their quote by five or six and make sure that I'm okay with paying that much, and I'd do that before I'd even think about ordering from them again. I'd make sure that if the money I gave them vaporized and my boards never arrived, there wouldn't be an issue. And if I really, truly did that, I think that I would find one of their competing assembly services based out of China as the next best value. In my mind, as long as the quality of all PCB's work is fantastic when it's delivered, they fix their quoting process to end this stupid negotiation, and they quit jerking us around to delay delivery with different excuses every week, they could eventually earn a recommendation. Of course, that's only if the quality of their delivered product is awesome and they start to deliver on time. For now, I can't even begin to imagine that this hassle will be worth it, so I probably won't use them again unless something substantially improves in their process. They currently have my parts on order and should be delivering the boards in a couple weeks. I cannot wait to do the incoming inspection and final assembly after these boards arrive. Did somebody say live stream? I'm pretty sure that I heard live stream. We might need to start this coffee fueled adventure at midnight, but I want our UPS, let's build this board, solder it all together. I want to see our hard work pay off. Do you think that all PCB will pull through and deliver a quality product to us? How do you want to be notified when we're live? Let us know in the comments. Our PCBs have been made and the parts should be delivered to the manufacturer in China for assembly. We'll have our UPS board soon enough if all PCB ever delivers. Subscribe to be notified of our future videos where we'll walk through the design process for the custom transformer used in our UPS and discuss soft start as it relates to power supplies and power switch circuits. I think that this UPS design is great, and this project is helping me to hone some new skills in negotiation, as well as remembering some old lessons learned. If you think this video was great, or you learned something about getting a PCB made today, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. 
Thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!